Hello and welcome to session six of our eight-part series on praying with the Gospel of John. If you remember uh, our last session, we took on the topic of the I am sayings of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and so on. And those I am sayings are scattered throughout both the Book of Signs and the Book of Glory. So we had paused in our kind of chronological move through the Gospel um, uh, to take a look at those signs scattered throughout the Gospel. Now we'll return to where we left off, which is the account of the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples on the night before he dies. and. Uh, this supper uh, is unusual in John's account. John is the only one that records the foot washing here with Jesus washing his disciples' feet. It's unique to John, and it differs from the account of the Last Supper in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they speak about bread and wine that he takes and equates to his upcoming suffering, the breaking of his own body and the shedding of his blood on the cross. So John doesn't have that uh, Eucharistic imagery. Uh, he focuses on the foot washing, and following the foot washing, he records a conversation between Jesus and his disciples in which the disciples seek to know who it is that is going to betray him. And he says, it's the one to whom I give the bread. And he takes a piece of bread and dips it in a bowl and then offers it to Judas Iscariot. The last thing we read of the supper is that Judas Iscariot went out into the night. And we know um, the power of that symbolism of night and darkness uh, for the gospel writer. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Judas Iscariot goes out to do the evil that he has planned to do, to meet with Jesus' enemies and to prepare to betray him. And Jesus turns his attention now to his disciples. And we have now a, a long discourse that begins and carries on for over three chapters in which he reassures the disciples and talks to them about what is to come. And before we take a look at it, let's pause for a prayer. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So as I mentioned, uh, Jesus here begins a long discourse that begins in chapter 31, 13, verse 31, carries all the way through the end of chapter 13 of 14, 15, and 16. And then seven, in chapter 17, there's a, a prayer that Jesus offers to the Father uh, for his uh, disciples. And then in 18, we begin the account of Jesus' betrayal and his arrest, his uh, trials, uh, and his uh, crucifixion. So uh, and John has included discourses before, lengthy discourses in which Jesus expounded on the meaning of one of his um, miracles or signs. Uh, and uh, so we've seen long discourses before. Um, this is the longest one by far, uh, in, uh, spanning over uh, three chapters. And if, if, if this were a word-by-word -word transcription of what Jesus said, we would have had to have a very skilled uh, uh, stenographer present at the, at the Last Supper to record all of this. But uh, what scholars think is that we have some sayings here that are authentic and were spoken probably in the context of the Last Supper. And then we have other material that's also been added, but that's been drawn from Jesus' other teachings uh, uh, during the course of his ministry. So what we have here is a, a long speech that the 
that the author of the gospel has put together, uh, drawing from the memory of uh, the disciples and the oral traditions that have uh, been passed along uh, this 60 year period since Jesus' death until the writing of the gospel. So he composes this long uh, discourse. Uh, we'll look at it in three parts. Um, up to this point, Jesus has, has been talking mostly uh, to uh, unbelievers. The first 12 chapters of the gospel, the prologue and the book of signs are focused on unbelievers. They're, these signs are given in order to bring people to believe. And so uh, Jesus explains things, but in a way that he is speaking to people, uh, inviting them to believe in him. This is slightly different because now Jesus turns to his own disciples. He's talking to believers and to his disciples, first of all, but also to the believing community, the Johannine community, that is the source of this gospel. And uh, this material is arising out of his deep concern for them and uh, his recognition that they are distraught at this point. They understand as well as he does now that the path of things, the trajectory that they're on is leading to his arrest and possible execution. And so they're afraid what will happen to them if Jesus is no longer with them? And uh, what, how, what should they anticipate? How will they cope? And Jesus here is uh, uh, modeling the Good Shepherd again, uh, not only by laying down his life, but also by his care for the sheep. He's responding out of love and offering them assurance and uh, promises that are meant to reduce their anxiety and their fear. So there are three parts to this discourse, and uh, I'll describe each of them and talk about the major themes in each, and then we will take a moment at the at the end to look at the prayer and look at the account of Jesus' arrest in the garden. The first part of this discourse is the part that begins in John 13, verse 31, and carries on through all of chapter 14. Basically, the, the, the most important theme here is Jesus' departure and his promise of a return. He says, I am going to be, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So he is he's telling them plainly that he is going away and that they will, uh, that he will not be present to them in the days to come. He gives them a new commandment to love one another as he has loved them. And then he begins to reassure them. Uh, he says, I, I'm going to come again. Don't let your hearts be troubled, he says in verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And of course, when the New Testament, when the Gospels use this term believe, it's, it's not used in the way that we uh, usually think of it in the modern era of believing, of giving a intellectual assent to something. Yes, I believe that to be true. It's not that sense at all. It's, it's the sense of personal trust. I believe in you. I, I trust in you. So Jesus is saying here, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God and trust me. Uh, he says, uh, believe in us means to put your whole trust in us. And that's the meaning of, of belief all through this text. Uh, belief is a very important theme, but what Jesus is, is wanting to convey by that theme is he wants us to be in intimate relationship with him, uh, a relationship of love and, and trust. So uh, he says, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, uh, and I am going away. He says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If I were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. So he encourages them to trust him, to believe in him. But one reason to trust is that his departure will be purposeful. He's going away in order to prepare a place for them. Uh, he's working on their behalf and he is preparing a place for them in heaven or in the region above from where he comes. And he wants this to be known by them and to uh, offer it as a sign of comfort to him and to us, which it certainly is to know that we have a place that is prepared for us uh, on the other side of death where we will uh, be at home and uh, in the company of Jesus. But here it's, it's not quite clear exactly what he means here when he's coming again. When is he coming again? Is he referring to he's, he's going to see them again after the resurrection uh, on Easter? Or is he uh, going to see them again after the coming of the Spirit? Or is he going to see him again at the end of time in the second coming? Or when is what is this referring to? And if you look carefully at chapter 14, you'll see references to both of those things. There's the, there's uh, first of all, this these first three verses of chapter uh, 14 point quite quite clearly to the uh, second coming of Jesus, where he gathers up his people and, and uh, brings them home. So here we have uh, something interesting in John because we mentioned before, when we talked about Nicodemus in second session two, we talked about uh, John's emphasis, uh, emphasis on a realized eschatology. In other words, when John talks about judgment, the judgment of God, He's not talking about a far off future event at the end of time or at the end of the world or even after our death. He's talking about something that takes place right now. And his realized eschatology means that Jesus coming into the world has provoked a crisis, a, a judgment as it were. And people can believe him or reject him. So they're going to make their own choice in, in how they respond to him. But this choice is going to divide them from the people who have believed and accepted him into people who have rejected them. So that kind of immediate judgment that is brought about by their own decision of whether to believe Jesus or not is the kind of uh, eschatology that's called realized eschatology. And that's contrasted to final eschatology, which is, which is that uh, in a future time, uh, God's judgment will take place. And here, so here is a reference to future eschatology, meaning that John's gospel has both. Um, it emphasizes this realized eschatology that a judgment is taking place even now, but it also recognizes that there will be a time in the future when uh, God's people will be gathered up to God and God will, uh, uh, God's judgment will, will flow and occur. So uh, both of these eschatologies are, are important. John's image of the last time that uh, he's speaking about here, he, he doesn't use the same kind of imagery that's used in some of the synoptic gospels. For example, in Mark's gospel, chapter 13, uh, verse 24 to 26, uh, Mark says, On this day, the day of the Lord, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. So Mark envisions a kind of apocalyptic event uh, where cosmic forces are at work at the end of time uh, as the world comes to an end. But here, uh, Jesus is anticipating a time when he will return, and he's much more concerned about the care of the disciples, uh, his care for them, his protection of them, um, their future. Um, and so he anticipates this time when he will return, not as a threat of some cosmic uh, uh, frightening disaster that will take place, but 
but rather as a sign of his, uh, his, his coming to rejoin them and to take them with him. So uh, the, the discussion is moved along by questions from the disciples. First of all, Thomas uh, uh, claims that he doesn't know the destination of Jesus, and he doesn't know the way that Jesus will take to get there. This is in chapter 14 in the fifth verse. And so this shows that the, the disciples haven't yet comprehended yet, or at least Thomas has not yet comprehended, that the cross will be the way by which Jesus returns to the Father. Jesus claims the way of dying and rising, what we call the Paschal mystery, as his way and as the only way for believers. So Jesus here is the only one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one that can lead his followers back to the place uh, uh, which has been prepared for them. Philip follows up with another request. He says, Lord, show us the Father. And here again, we see the disciples not understanding. Uh, Philip has not understood what was stated clearly in the prologue, that no one can see God, but that uh, God's only Son is the one who reveals him to us. So he, he doesn't yet understand that seeing Jesus is seeing the Father that Jesus reveals the Father, that Jesus and the Father are one. He hasn't yet understand this. So he says, show us the Father. And Jesus naturally responds and says, Philip, I've been with you so long. How come you haven't understood this yet? That when you see me, you're seeing the Father. The Father and I are one. So uh, there's nothing to be shown to you. Um, uh, he is uh, one with the Father. And when you see him, um, you see the Father. When he speaks, you're hearing the voice of the Father. So he identifies so closely with the one that he calls Father that uh, for the disciples to have seen and known him, they are also uh, seeing and knowing uh, who God is. Jesus is not just a religious teacher or guide. He is the one in whom God uh, can be found. Uh, Jesus has spoken uh, of his return to offer comfort to the disciples in their troubled state. And now he says, uh, I'm also promising you another advocate, uh, another advocate. And the Greek word that's used here is the word paraclete, which means one called alongside. It's actually a Greek term that's a legal term that refers to a counselor or an advocate who comes alongside a person who has been accused of something. So to stand by a defendant in a trial or to advocate for them is, is the sense of this uh, spirit. So in some, in some versions it's called the comforter, but it's, uh, 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 the better word is probably advocate. It's, a, it's a, more than just a comforter. It's uh, someone who comes to defend. And to, uh, and to protect. So the Spirit then will be a protector and a defender of the, of the disciples. And so he's got two promises here. One is, I'm going away, but I'm going to return. And the second is, I'm going to send you the paraclete, the advocate, who will protect and defend you. And uh, uh, so he's offering his reassurance, his love. It's the great uh, good shepherd uh, caring for his own. Uh, Judas, uh, the one not Iscariot, there were two disciples named Judas, one not Iscariot asks, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answers that the Father comes to dwell and make his home in those who keep his words and who uh, follow his commandments. And so um, the, the answer implies that, uh, in, that uh, God comes to those whose hearts are ready to receive him and, um, and takes up his abode uh, with them. So in John's Gospel, this, this word cosmos uh, used for the world 
most of the time represents the human environment that is in rebellion against God, the world, uh, in opposition to God, and in need of salvation. Um, just like the Pharisees that we saw in chapter 9 uh, of the Gospel who belong to the world, uh, Jesus recognizes that such people cannot perceive or penetrate the deeper things of God, and they won't understand the mystery of the Holy Spirit. But the disciples can know the spirit of truth uh, because Jesus has been with them all along, and they will be with him in the future. The world is left out uh, because it does not love God. The presence of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit can only be known through love. There's a second promise uh, here in chapter 14 of the Spirit. First, uh, the emphasis is on the Spirit as advocate, the paraclete, the defender. And now uh, Jesus says the Spirit will come to you and he will also be a teacher. And so the role of teacher is emphasized. And the Spirit is the one who will take the things that I said uh, and remind you of them. He will prevent you from, uh, from error and keep you from going astray. He will teach you all things. So we have a second uh, uh, reference to the coming of the Spirit, but here the emphasis is on uh, the Spirit as teacher. And then finally Jesus offers his blessing, his peace, his shalom to his disciples as his farewell. It is not the peace of the world, but a peace that comes from being freed uh, from sin and united to God. And it is really only completed. Um, it, it, it is the, it's the peace that completes us, um, that makes us whole. So after, uh, after these two things, first of all, his, his insistence that he's going to leave them, but his promise that he will come again to uh, receive them and to, uh, and to have them with him. Uh, and now the promise of the Holy Spirit, the defender, the protector, and the teacher. And so now at the at close of this uh, chapter, he gives his blessing to them. He grants them his peace, his shalom. Uh, it's his farewell to them. And he said it's not the peace of the world. It's a, it's a peace that comes from being freed from sin and united to God. And it's really the, the fulfillment of their, their heart's desire. So he, he gives his blessing, his peace to them. And then notice how chapter 14, if you have your Bible handy, chapter 14, uh, notice how it ends in chapter 14, verse 31. So Jesus says, uh, at the end of chapter 14, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me. So he's He's showing them again. He's, he's, what he's about to do, he's doing in obedience to the Father, not because the evil one has power over him. He is the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for the sheep. And so what he's doing is what the Father has asked of him. He's doing as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. And then he says to them, rise, let us be on our way which seems to conclude this speech after the Last Supper. So the supper has ended, he's given this speech, he's going away, he's going to come again, he's sending the, uh, the advocate, the protector, and the teacher, and now he says, okay, let's be on our way, rise, let us be on our way. But what's interesting is scholars note that there is the pickup to this, the, the logical next step for this, we find in chapter 18. So just for the moment, skip over 15, 16, and 17, and go to the beginning of chapter 18 of John's Gospel. And chapter 18, verses, verse 1 says, After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley 
to the place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And so uh, chapter 18 picks up where chapter 14 leaves off. Chapter 14, rise, let us be on our way. Chapter 18, after Jesus has spoken these words, he and went with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to enter into the garden. And that, of course, is the Garden of Gethsemane, although it's not mentioned as Gethsemane here. Uh, it's mentioned as Gethsemane in uh, Matthew and Mark. So uh, uh, scholars uh, think that this uh, chapter 14, the end of chapter 13 and chapter 14 might have been the part that's most likely to have been connected with the actual supper and Jesus explaining his, uh, his soon separation from them and consoling them with the promise of his return and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, uh, the next section of the gospel would be from 18 on, where we, 18 begins the, the story of the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. So uh, chapter 15 and 16 may represent additional teaching that's been brought into from other sources. And chapter 17, of course, is a prayer that he prays for them. Now, we don't know if all of this took place on the same night or if this was added later from different sources. Um, but it seems uh, from the last verse of chapter 14 and the first verse of chapter 18, it seems that that uh, was once a, a, a conjoined point that's been separated now and additional material has been inserted in there. Um, so that's, that's part one of the discourse. Uh, and then we see, interestingly enough, in uh, a little bit later in chapter 16, there's a section of chapter 16, uh, verses 4 through 33, most of the chapter, is a repeat of what we've had in chapter 14. So we have the first discourse in chapter 14, and then the similar, similar themes repeated in chapter 16. Uh, themes like uh, uh, Jesus speaking of his, his departure and speaking of his separation from the disciples, uh, speaking of the sorrow of the disciples and of where he is going. The same ideas that we saw in John chapter 14 are repeated in John chapter 16. And uh, again, the, the Spirit's coming is announced in chapter 16. The paraclete is coming and the teacher is coming. Uh, uh, both of those aspects are alluded to. Here, the paraclete is not just a defender. It's almost uh, the paraclete seems to be a little bit more... Uh, um, assertive. He becomes like the prosecuting attorney or something. And he is, there are, in, in this court language that John is using here, there are really uh, three uh, uh, participants. Uh, there is the world, which is, uh, is going to be convicted because, uh, because of their sin. They have refused to believe. And so the world is, is judged uh, in, in this courtroom language, courtroom scene. The world is judged because of its failure to believe. Jesus is the, is the second one, and he is vindicated uh, because um, um, he's, he's condemned to death by Pilate and uh, by the Romans and, and the Jews, but he's going to be vindicated, and the justice of his cause is going to be proved. And, uh, and then the third uh, entity is, is Satan, or the evil one, who seems to triumph in the crucifixion, but who has really um, just uh, engaged in a downfall. Um, uh, and so the truth about Satan will come out. He only seems to uh, triumph at first, but he is really uh, going to uh, be destroyed. So uh, there's this, this uh, language, court-like language, of uh, the, the paraclete uh, coming not only to defend, but also 
to judge uh, uh, Satan and to judge the world and to vindicate Jesus. So um, just as in chapter 14, chapter 16 concludes with the spirit as a teacher uh, coming uh, and, uh, and it shows us again the misunderstanding of the disciples and it speaks a little bit of the rejection of the world. Uh, the disciples are confused. They say, what does it mean uh, when you say a little while and you will not see me and then a little while and you will see me again? What are you talking about? They're still not understanding that his trajectory of return to the Father. And so uh, finally at the end of chapter 16 they begin to be coming around and they're beginning to understand this. And Jesus asks them if they understand and they claim that they do understand. So uh, uh, in chapter 16, verse 29, his disciples say, yes, now you are speaking plainly and not in any figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need to have anyone question you. By this we believe that you came from God. And so now they're professing that they, that they, that they understand. And Jesus tells them, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to your home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. So we have the same mention of peace, the blessing of peace, and the assurance that he has conquered the world to relieve uh, their uh, anxieties and fears. So uh, we have <laughs> First discourse in chapter 14, paralleled by a lot of chapter 16. So we'll just slide that over and say this is a, this is a, this is the first discourse, kind of repeated again. Now it might have been two versions of the first discourse that both got included in the text, um, but uh, somehow this, these remarkably similar uh, passages uh, get included in the discourse. And scholars say that the, the amount of content and the order, the organization of these passages uh, suggests that this was, uh, uh, that the, the one mirrors the other, that they're really uh, coming from the same uh, source. Jesus says, you will face persecution, but take courage. I have overcome the world. I have conquered the world. Uh, so that's, a, that's the first part of the discourse. And then the second part would be chapter 15, uh, beginning at the first verse and going to chapter 16, verse 4. And chapter 15, you remember, we spoke about this uh, at, in previous session, last session, begins with the analogy of the vine and the branches. And Jesus uses this image of the vine and the branches to talk about the intimacy of communi communion and union that he wants to experience with the disciples, which they can have with him. It's similar to his union and uh, uh, communion with the Father. And so just as he is in the Father and the Father is in him, he abides in God and God abides in him. So he wants to abide in us and he wants us to abide in him, to have that same intimate connection. So John's spirituality is a, is a spirituality of love, but it's also a spirituality of intimacy. And the disciples are supposed to be so joined with Jesus that they become one and that his life becomes their life and his strength becomes their strength. And when they're connected like this, then their lives are fruitful. So he's talking about a mystical union that his disciples can, can be in with him that will be fruit bearing. And uh, they, uh, they love him and keep his commandments and he loves them and joins himself to them. 
So this, this is a teaching again for believers, uh, and this is meant to um, be consolation, to be teaching about what happens when he is no longer there. He says, I'm going away, I'm going to be separated from you, I'm departing, returning to the Father, but we can still have this intimate bond, this intimate connection. Uh, in chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus had described this kind of life of intimacy with God. And he used this word, he says, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So this idea of abiding, uh, Jesus and the Father coming to abide in, in us, in our hearts, uh, in this intimate connection and union. Now the same idea is presented here in chapter 15 using this special uh, Johannine word that he often uses, abide. Abide, it's sometimes translated remain, but the idea is, uh, is one of union, uh, the two uh, uh, people coming together in a very tight bond. So, uh, one thing interesting to know that sometimes we, if, if we think about abiding, we might have a rather passive view of that. In other words, kind of resting in Jesus and enjoying our fellowship with Jesus, but it's, it's not a very active thing. It's, it feels like a passive word to us. Uh, abide in me that feels feels like a passive uh, invitation to rest uh, but in the Greek word the Greek word for abide has a bit of an edge to it and so it's a little bit different than uh, our word abide the Greek word that's used here and that's translated as abide or receive has an edge to it and it's it would be it would be more appropriate to translate it something like uh, hanging in there. <laughs> uh, Jesus saying, I'll abide in you, you abide in me. And he's really saying, I'm going to hang in there with you. I'm going to stick it out with you. And you hang in there with me. And you stick it out with me. And we'll stick it out together, kind of. And so it has that kind of tougher edge to it um, that requires, uh, or that uh, in, in implies a kind of... Uh, um, binding together and uh, resisting uh, um, persecution and uh, evil and trouble. Uh, we're going to stick it out together, <laughs> Jesus is saying here. He knows his followers are going to face real challenges when he is gone. And, and so these words are meant to be a promise and a source of consolation to his followers. Listen to the words of John chapter 15, beginning verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Uh, so we see, we see Jesus here naming us as his friends and saying, I, uh, you are not like servants to me, you are friends, because I'm able to disclose to you um, what I'm doing, what I'm about. Um, and a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but a friend might know what the purpose or intentions of, of a friend is. So Jesus uh, calls us friends here, which is, of course, a great person, um, a great privilege. In the, in the la a latter part of John chapter 15, then he turns his attention toward the persecution, which is to follow. And um, just as the Father has uh, testified for his love of the Son by sending his Son into the world, so Jesus uh, testifies to his love for his followers by sending them likewise into the world. They will, they will be on mission as he was on mission uh, to reveal God, uh, to teach others 
about God, to bring others to belief and to, um, and this mission will arouse the hatred of the world, just as the world has opposed Jesus, its opponents have been uh, critical of him, so the disciples can accept a similar uh, treatment. Um, but he says, uh, um, uh, he's, he's warning them to expect this. this, this will come. And he's even specific, he says specifically, you'll be put out of the synagogues and you may even be killed by those who think they will be doing God's will. But just as Jesus had his hour, his hour uh, of suffering, uh, that was really part of his glorification, so too they will have their hour and uh, encounter suffering, uh, which leads to glorification. The third part of the final discourse, then, is, the, is what's called the high priestly prayer in John 17. Jesus standing before the Father, praying for his disciples, uh, much as a, a priest would pray for, uh, for his people. Uh, so the priestly prayer in John 17 is, um, is a separate unit uh, and, and kind of uh, after the discourse, Jesus turns his attention to his Father and offers this prayer. The opening uh, section uh, is Jesus addressing the Father. Um, we're in the context now of uh, what John calls his hour. His hour has come, and he is ready to be uh, returning now to the Father. And so now he can be a source of eternal life uh, to those who uh, believe in him. That will be the fruit of his glorification. And his glorification will also enable the coming of the Spirit. And so um, uh, Jesus prays for them. Um, he prays that they'll be protected, and he prays that they'll be sanctified in truth. So he's praying for their protection from evil and from persecution from the world. He's also um, praying for their diligence and their uh, commitment uh, in, their, in their mission. Uh, he says, um, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. Now that should strike a chord again because we've heard the name. Remember the I am sayings, the name. Every time he, he says this, I have made your name known, God's name known to those uh, who have uh, come to believe. So he prays for their protection, uh, especially in verse 11, uh, and then for their dedication. Uh, um, in verses 17 to 19. Um, uh, he says that uh, just as, as he's been sent into the world, so they are going to be sent into the world. They're not to withdraw from the world. They are to, to go full on uh, toward the world uh, and to conquer it uh, in a sense. So Jesus has, has, has won the victory, uh, but the working out of that victory is uh, in time is the work of the disciples. So to strengthen them, Jesus says, I consecrate myself, I sanctify myself, and uh, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. Um, he, he finally, in the, the last part of the prayer, he prays for those who will come after, those who will believe because of the witness and the life and the message and the mission of the apostles. So he prays for future generations of believers, and he, uh, he commends them to God's care and, and protection. He wants uh, unity. He prays for unity. He prays that they all may be one. And uh, they, they are joined together, Christians everywhere, in every age and in every place, joined together by the indwelling of Jesus, by this intimate connection that they have with Jesus, uh, branches into the vine, but also by the promise of eternal life um, that begins even now for John. Uh, this is the great bond of unity that connects all Christians. Um, so uh, he concludes this uh, prayer, and then we come to chapter 18. And as I mentioned before, Jesus says, um, uh, he, 
after he has said these words, he goes out with his disciples. Um, if you've been to Jerusalem before, you remember the old city and you remember the valley that slopes down from the eastern side of the uh, eastern wall of the old city into the Kidron Valley. And there used to be a, a Wadi, a river there, and, uh, and then it rises again into the Mount of Olives. And so he comes down into that place where if you've been to Jerusalem, you have um, uh, perhaps had occasion to visit the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus isn't, uh, uh, John doesn't uh, refer to it as Gethsemane, but he describes what happens there. And what happens there is particularly Johannine again. Remember, we said in, jo in John's Gospel, that Jesus is willingly laying down his life. It's not being taken from him. He's not a victim, but he's, he's laying down his life in obedience to the Father, and uh, he's fulfilling the Father's purposes. Uh, the Father and He are working together for for the cause of salvation, and so He uh, He lays down His life voluntarily, and so here comes uh, Judas and this band of soldiers, which include Roman soldiers, and even include a tribunal. So. Uh, this is a cohort of Roman soldiers that come with some of the chief priests and the, to arrest Jesus at night. They're led by Judas. In the Synoptic Gospels, Judas is the betrayer. He kisses Jesus and indicates which one is Jesus. Not so in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, Jesus approaches and initiates the whole, the whole encounter. And so Jesus walks right up to them and says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, what? Ego, I am. I am. I am the one. I am he. Ego, I may. I am. So he, uh, he and as soon as he says that, uh, the soldiers, everyone falls down out of uh, fear. And so here we have... Um, we have this, this band of soldiers coming with weapons and with torches and lanterns. Now notice too that it's nighttime, which is the time for John of, of evil and misunderstanding. And um, uh, so there's darkness all around. And uh, these, uh, these agents of darkness are carrying with them uh, false lights, artificial lights, lamps and torches. Um, and uh, trying to uh, squelch out the light of the world. Uh, but they won't succeed, as John has promised us. Uh, the darkness does not extinguish the light. So there's no kiss here. The, uh, Judas is, doesn't play a major role here. Jesus uh, presents himself. And uh, we see the soldiers falling down in fear. It, uh, Jesus is very much in control of the whole process now as it goes on. So next, uh, in our next session, we'll talk about uh, Jesus being arrested now in the garden and brought first to uh, the high priest's uh, home and court uh, to be judged there and then uh, passed on to Pilate. So next week, we'll look at both of those trials, the trial before the Caiaphas, the high priest, and then also the trial before Pontius Pilate and the crucifixion. And then on our final week, two weeks uh, away, our final session, we'll look at the uh, joyous news of the resurrection in John's Gospel. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, God bless you this week.